title of our message today is Our Book, Part 48. We will be looking at 12 verses. 12 is God's kingdom number, and we're going to learn an awful lot about God's kingdom in these 12 verses from Revelation 20, verse 4, through Revelation 20, 15. Beginning with verse 4, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. For a thousand years. But first, let's pray. And there are two names I want to lift before you and ask you to keep them in prayer this week and uh, for the foreseeable future. Jerry is a church member from my last district before I came here. And Benjamin, a request from the district before that in Florida. So, uh, the doctors have written both of these men off. But we serve a great physician. And prayer has power. So I would invite you to join me in this prayer. Father, so many, so many, have been touched by the enemy. And you know, I've had more prayer requests and I suspect my fellow pastors around the world can say the same thing. More hearts are turning to you today than perhaps ever. I don't know, you know. I lift Jerry, I lift Benjamin, trusting that you know the situation in both cases, you know exactly what their response should be, and we trust you to make that response in their lives. We merely invite you to make your presence, your power, your plan, your love, and your healing touch available according to your wisdom. We ask that for Jerry and Benjamin as we ask it for everyone right now in need of you. Lord, I pray that you would take everything I might say and throw it all away. Please let your words flow. Please let your truth glow. Make divine love reign from above. Fix our eyes upon the prize of your high calling. And let us each one Cease from our stalling. In Jesus' name, amen. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Them refers to the redeemed of all ages, from faithful Abel, to the last martyr before the second coming, before the close of probation, I should say. There will be no martyrs after the close of probation. But the redeemed of all ages, those who are alive when you come, those who have fallen asleep trusting in you before you come, we are told in your holy word that they will each set upon a throne and you will entrust judgment to them. Paul was aware of this also. 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Well, I've got to tell you, I haven't judged an angel yet. We don't judge angels now, but we will judge them those who followed Lucifer in their rebellion against heaven, we will sit in judgment upon them. 
They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Among other things, this is the second phase of judgment. The first phase is going on right now. As God is determining whose name is in that book of life and whose name is not in the book of life. That phase is going on right now. How do I know that? Well, the Bible tells me that when Jesus returns, he brings his reward with him. And if he's going to bring his reward with him, he has to determine in advance who's going to get it and what it's going to be. If I'm going to give a reward away, I first have to determine what the reward is, and then I have to figure out who's going to get it. Don't I? That's just logic. And it's the truth. When he comes, he will bring his reward, and he is making that determination as we speak. And this will be our chance to review this second phase of judgment, will be our chance to review God's judgment before it is executed. And as I've mentioned in previous sermons, that is the clearest picture I know of, of God's character, a character of humility, a character of love, a character of regard. Regard. (laughs) Can you imagine it? Regard for us. He allows us to review his decision. Nobody's been executed yet. You may be thinking, well, what about Alejandro? Zamora, we just remembered him. And he has died. But you've got to remember that Jesus calls that sleep. And sleep doesn't hurt. Sleep is not a penalty. Jesus is going to wake him up. He's actually going to wake everybody up, but not all at the same time. And we're going to see that in chapter 20. There are two separate resurrections, one for the redeemed and one for the lost. And Revelation 20 is going to reveal that very clearly to us. So this period of time, this 1,000 years that we live and reign with Christ is that Among other things, it's an opportunity for us to review what God has done. If I'm there and one of you is not, it's not that I think God made a mistake, but I'm going to want to know, how did I fail as their pastor? And believe me, if you're not there, I will feel like a failure if I'm there without you. How did I fail? And I'm going to want to go look at the books. And I am assured that when I look at the books, I will see it all. I don't think God's books are confined to what we can produce with paper and pen. I think God's books probably are holographic, more like our CD in 3D. And it will be very clear where I failed you. Please, don't let me fail you. Let's go together. What do you say? It's also our opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from the best teacher. I promise you, I never purposely teach a lie, but I also promise you I don't know everything. Jesus knows everything. (laughs) And when we sit at his feet, we will learn exactly what the truth is. I look forward to that day with all of my heart. It's also our opportunity for the Holy Spirit to finish growing us 
into citizens of heaven. There are churches that think we have to be full grown or we can't get to heaven. That's simply not true. And I have a verse here for you, which you're familiar with by now. I've used it a few times. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And being sanctified simply means allowing the Holy Spirit to grow us. We're, we're growing. If we're growing, we're going. You've heard me say that. And that's exactly what that verse is teaching us. Which means that when Jesus comes back, some of us won't be full grown. But that's okay. All God really needs to know is that we're willing to grow. He's going to have a thousand years to finish it. He just needs to know, are we willing to grow? This is also the difference between those deceived and those deceiving. We're going to look at the uh, same thing we looked at in, in chapter 19 last week. Chapter 20 brings it back around. The fact that the devil, the dragon, uh, the beast, the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Everybody else is killed by the sword of truth. So what really is the difference there? I mean, we've already looked at the fact that people who sincerely worship God, even though they're deceived, if their worship is sincere, he reads the heart. And he's not going to hold something against a person when they don't understand it. That's not, what, that's not how love works. Are, are you ever going to punish a three-year-old because he can't drive a car? That's just not how love works. But if that three-year-old is growing, the day is coming when he will drive a car. So, the difference. The deceived see some new truth. How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit is always working to show us new things. To grow us into citizenship of his kingdom. The Holy Spirit never sits down and never shuts up. I know there are people who wish I would sit down and shut up, but the Holy Spirit won't. And so they see something new. But they refuse to grow. And if they refuse to grow or what, over whatever it is, that little thing that the Holy Spirit just showed them, if they refuse to grow, that tells God, I, I, with 10,000 years, I couldn't fix them. If they won't grow, they can't go. The beast and the false prophet know the truth. But they teach the lie. See, that's the difference. There are people who will be there who were deceived. And they lived up to all the light they had. They, they allowed the Holy Spirit to lead them in whatever direction he could lead them, given the circumstances in which they were living. And as long as they were growing, they're going to be there. They, they don't have it all figured out, sure. Guess what? <laughs> Neither do I. I don't have it all figured out either. I'm still growing, learning. But the beast, and we've, we've already studied that. I don't have to tell you who the beast is. You know. Prophecy has revealed it to us. And the false prophet, we've already found that. If you're listening right now and you don't know those two things, you need to back up and catch up. All of these are 
archived on our Facebook page. You can listen to the whole series. Start with number one and work your way through. When you finish, you can read Revelation just like reading a newspaper. Well, maybe I should say just like reading the news on the internet. Because I suspect not many of us even get a newspaper anymore. The beast and the false prophet know the truth, but they teach the lie for selfish reasons. The rest of the dead, verse 5, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. We're looking here at the first resurrection. The righteous get to go and spend a thousand years with Christ after that first resurrection. The rest of the dead, they don't, they don't live again until the thousand years are over. The saints are in heaven, the lost are dead, and no one is left behind. I know that is a popular theme right now in a lot of Christianity, but it's fiction. It is not biblical. And we just read what the Bible has to say. During the thousand years, the redeemed are with Jesus, the lost are dead. End of story. Nobody is left behind. They will remain dead for 1,000 years. Verse 6, blessed and holy is he who has part in, our, in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a 1,000 years. In other words, the saints have been given immortality. Over such, the second death has no power. That's simply what the Bible says. I'm not making this up, folks. The second death will have no power over them because they have been given immortality, which means they did not have it. Nobody has immortality. As a matter of fact, the Bible comes right out and says it. God alone hath immortality. He's the only one who has it. And he can give it to whomever he pleases. And here, he has given it to the redeemed. Paul speaks of this very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. At the last trumpet, that refers to the second coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 makes that clear. That last trumpet is the second coming. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Now this is not a morality statement, it's a biological statement. We become corrupted when we are buried. Our body falls apart. It decays. It goes back to the dust of the earth, the way the Bible says it. That is the corruption being spoken of here. This corruptible, this body that can fall apart at death must put on incorruption, a body that will not fall apart and will not die. And this mortal must put on immortality. This is talking about you and me. This is fascinating stuff. Don't you want to have a different body than you have now? Come on. There was, a, there was a time, I don't know, somewhere around 35, I guess. I was pretty happy with my body. I'm not going to go down that that avenue very far, but I was. I, I, you know, I felt pretty good about myself. It lasted maybe three days. But that, that, that's over with, folks. I, I'm ready for another one. And the Bible promises me 
that. This is God's word. This is more reliable than anything you can think of. And this is God's promise to each and every one of us. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then, see Paul makes it clear when this happens, then, at the second coming, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, it's just a word that means grave. Oh, grave, where is your victory? The same Holy Spirit was speaking to Paul and John. And guess what? He's speaking to you right now. Same Holy Spirit. These are God's words. He wants them to be understood. He doesn't want us to dance around them and try to pretend they don't mean what they say. Verse 6. Reign with him. I don't know if you realize this or not, but God intends to treat us as equals. We, we don't deserve that. I'm not saying we are equals. We are definitely not equals. But doesn't it say a lot about him? That he is going to treat us as equals? He says that we will reign with him. He doesn't say we'll reign under him. We reign with him. None of us None of us could live up to that. It's a gift. It's what God's love is all about. You can't explain it another way. There is no other way to explain it. This is what his love for us is all about. Verse, verse 7. When the thousand years have expired... Satan will be released from his prison. Now we talked about it last week. He was bound for a thousand years in solitary confinement by a chain of circumstances. All of the people who followed him instead of Jesus are now dead. He has no one to tempt. He has nothing to do for a thousand years except celebrate the Sabbath. Remember? We talked about it last, not last week. Peter says the day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And so there's going to be a one thousand year Sabbath. We're going to spend that Sabbath with God in heaven. And Lucifer is going to spend that Sabbath here alone. He's tried for the last 6,000 years to keep us from remembering the day that God made holy. The way God asks us to remember it. He has tried to give us a false day. So that we could pretend that we worship. But we will be doing it our way instead of God's way. And now, he has no choice. He will keep the Sabbath for 1,000 years. And I have to believe it's going to rankle. <laughs> he is not going to be a happy camper for 1,000 years. But at the end of the 1,000 years, there is going to be another resurrection. A resurrection of the lost. And when the millennium is over... Verse 8, they will go out to deceive the nations. The devil will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. This battle is a physical assault upon the new Jerusalem which has come down to this earth from heaven. 
and in the next verse you see that clearly. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And we've already learned in our study what this means. They are turned into smoke and ashes. They are gone. They do not burn forever and ever and ever. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be torment, tormented day and night forever and ever. Oh, but pastor, you just said they won't be forever and ever. That's what you want to say to me, right? You just said they won't be and this says they will be. Well, we talked about this last week. And the fact that the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire along with the devil. So not all of the lost go into the lake of fire. And we just looked at the, the difference. The beast and the false prophet know the truth, teach the lie. The rest refuse to grow. They couldn't go because they refused to grow. The Holy Spirit showed them something new and they refused to grow into whatever that was. You know, I, I can't say what it was. I know that during this series, I cannot imagine a person who has gone through this series and doesn't realize that virtually the whole Christian world is worshiping God on the wrong day. I, I, I can't believe that would happen. If you have gone through this series, you know that the prophecy has been fulfilled that says the devil will deceive. He has deceived. And most of Christianity will be in church tomorrow. Which is the venerable day of the sun. The day the sun was worshipped. The day of Baal was worshipped. The day Aphrodite was worshipped. But never the day that God was worshipped. I can't believe anybody could go through this series and still think that the first day of the week is the holy day. So if you have seen that, it's not the holy day. And the Bible clearly tells us which day is the holy day. Then the Holy Spirit is asking you to grow, isn't he? He's asking you to step up and follow where he's leading. Pardon my passion, but I, I just more than I can take in that people would resist what God so plainly reveals. So right here we find that not all of the lost are going to go into the lake of fire. And we looked at that last week as well. But it does say they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And, and I just said they wouldn't be. So does that mean I got it wrong? Well, you already know I have my answer ready. <laughs> Ezekiel 28 and beginning with verse 18. Speaking, God is speaking to Lucifer, to the devil, to Satan, to the dragon, to the enemy of us all you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities by the iniquity of your trading therefore i brought fire from your midst it devoured you and i turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you so again we see that word devoured i want you to notice the bible fits together it complements itself in its various parts so we see the exact same picture here that we looked at in revelation devoured you turned you to ashes upon the earth all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you you have become a horror and shall be no more forever Ooh. so which forever has got it right which one is right I mean, forever is used in both places. 
Well, they're both right. But we have to understand how the Bible uses this word. Psalms 9, verse 5. You have rebuked the nations. David is talking to God. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. That can't be right, can it? I mean, we just saw the wicked will be back briefly to attack the New Jerusalem. Right? I mean, we just read that. And, and David has said they're destroyed forever and ever. Well, if they are blotted out ultimately forever, then they aren't burning forever. Right? Can't have it both ways. They're either blotted out forever or they're burning forever. So how do we resolve that? The Bible does not disagree with itself. I promise you, the Bible never disagrees with itself. So how do we resolve this? Well, let's look at some more. Psalms 145, 1. David is writing, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Really, David? Because in Acts 2.29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Not still praising God, but he did as long as he lived. He did praise God as long as he lived. Exodus 21.6, then his master shall bring him. This is if a slave who has uh, indentured himself for a period of six years. In the seventh year, he's supposed to go free. So uh, an Israelite could not indenture himself for longer than six years. And if he has done that, and uh, he was unmarried when he did it, but during that six years, he met his soulmate, and they were married, and at the end of the six years, he can go free. But his wife, perhaps not she may still be in bondage. We don't know when she gets to go free, if ever. We don't, when I say if ever, it's because we don't know if she's an Israelite or not. They didn't limit bondage if, of non-Israelites. So at that time, the man can say, wait a minute, I love my wife, and I don't mind the job that you've got me doing. I'm willing to stay here and be with her, and I will remain in bondage to you because of my love for her. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Really? <laughs> Just till he dies. Just until he dies. He's not still serving that man. 1 Kings 12, 7, they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people, now this is King Rehoboam, and his counselors are telling him how he should respond to the crowd that has demanded him that he lighten Solomon's load. Solomon was Rehoboam's father. And uh, so they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. No, they won't. But as long as they live, they could be his servants as long as they live, couldn't they? They weren't because he didn't follow the advice of these counselors. 1 Samuel 1, 22. Hannah did not go up to the temple for she had said to her husband, not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. Does she mean forever? There are people who would say, well, that is what she meant. Even when Samuel died, he still served the Lord. In, now in heaven instead of on the earth, but he's still serving the Lord. You think that's what Hannah meant? Well, let me show you what the Bible says Hannah meant. In verse 11, O Lord of hosts, 
If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. That's what Hannah meant. But she used the word forever interchangeably with that concept. Forever meant all the days of his life. As long as he lives. That's what forever means in the Bible. So in chapter 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever, as long as they live. Malachi 4.1 tells us, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now some apply this to uh, this day, the day is coming, to an indeterminate length of time, an age. An age is coming when they will be burning. Let's look a little further in verse 3. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. I believe hell will be over in less than a day. We're told that we will trample, we will walk upon the ashes of the wicked. So hell will be over and the ashes will cool down in one day and we will walk on those ashes. Now I will tell you, because I want to be straight with you, this word on in the King James is translated in. So you can still interpret it the other way. You can still say this is an indeterminate length of time, it's an age that they will be burning. But the translators of the New King James Version that's what I'm reading from here, the New King James Version, on the day, agree with me that it is a day, on the day. They agree with me. And to disagree with me, and with what I perceive the Bible to be teaching, it's not me. I mean, you can disagree with me all you want. I'm nobody. But to disagree with what the Bible seems to be teaching here, you have to attribute something to God that I believe is inconceivable. You have to believe that God miraculously sustains life for the purpose of torture. And that's not a God of love. That is a monster. To miraculously sustain life for the purpose of torture is the description of a monster, not a description of love. So, for whatever it's worth, I believe hell will be over in a very short period of time. And this is what the Lord of hosts says. How can you argue with the Lord of hosts? The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, so that sounds like it has to be at least 12 hours. To, to touch a day and a night, it has to be at least 12 hours. Well, I just want to point out that the original word there, just like the original word in the previous verse, could be on or in. In this case, it can be and or or, day or night. So it just, it simply means they will feel torment until they die. They will feel what is happening to their body until their body is dead. That's all it means. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. The stage is now set for the third phase of judgment. First phase happening right now. Second phase, during the millennium, we get to review what God has done. Third phase, this is when the execution takes place, but not 
until everybody agrees that God is doing the right thing. Verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. The books referred to here are the books of remembrance, and they are between your ears. The Holy Spirit, one of his jobs, one of the things the Bible says that he does is bring things to your remembrance. And he is able to have your whole life flash before you in a heartbeat. You can see everything all at once, your whole life. The books of remembrance have just been opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. When your whole life flashes before you and you're outside the walls of the New Jerusalem trying to attack that city because the devil has deceived you again and told you that you can breach those walls and capture the tree of life and have immortality without God granting it to you. I suspect his, his message will go something like this. And obviously I'm speculating. I don't read the devil's mind. He can't read mine either, so we're even there. But I suspect he will tell them, look, I had the power to resurrect you. Well, that's a lie. If he had the power to resurrect them, he would have done it a thousand years ago. <laughs> he wouldn't have waited till now. But that's what he'll say, I think. I had the power to resurrect you. And I can sustain your life for a while. But I don't have the power to keep you alive forever. We have to have the tree of life. And it's just on the other side of those walls. All we have to do is breach those walls and capture that tree and we can live forever and God be damned. I believe that's what the devil will say. Now I might have got a few verses, a few verbs and subjects a little bit out of kilter. He may have a better way of saying it, but essentially that's going to be the message, I believe. And he's going to have you know, I can't judge. I'm not saying I can judge, but in all probability, let's just say, in all probability, he's going to have Genghis Khan. He's going to have Julius Caesar. He's going to have, well, I'm not going to name any people who have, are living right now. <laughs> I don't get to judge. But he's going to have military giants from all of Earth's history. And they're going to look at the walls of Jerusalem and they're going to say, it's, <laughs> hey guys, it's made out of transparent gold. We can see through it. I mean, there's the tree of life right there. I can see it right through the wall. <laughs> this is not a problem. We can take that city. No, you can't. <laughs> it's not the wall that protects it. It is the God of this universe. And you won't get an inch that he doesn't give you. And it's at that time that the books of remembrance are opened. Between everybody's ears. And they all see how their friends, their family, their loved ones pled with them. How the Holy Spirit pled with them to grow into the citizen for God's kingdom of love. They will see how time after time after time they rejected it. Time after time after time they said, no, I won't grow. I'm just fine the way I am. Leave me alone, Holy Spirit. I don't need you. And when they see clearly that it's, on their, it's their own fault that they're on the wrong side of that wall, the Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and the third phase of judgment is now over. 
everybody agrees God is just. God is doing the right thing. And now, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Works and motive that prompted the works. Both have to be looked at. 1 Samuel tells us that in chapter 16 and verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the motive, the works and the motive behind the works, that's what God looks at. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, when sin is gone, death will die. How do I know that? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ending sin destroys death. If you end sin, you end death. That's exactly what the Bible is showing us. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But we already know they're not alive. Unless they're the beast or the false prophet or the devil. This is talking about the fact that the earth will be purified by fire. But the only ones who will feel the fire are the ones who knew it was a lie and told it anyway. Faith in Christ's sacrifice, reliance upon God's power. You want to know how you get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You have faith in Christ's sacrifice, and you rely upon God's power, not your power, but God's power. And you're guided by the Holy Spirit. Why did I have to say that last part? Because you can profess to have faith in Christ's sacrifice, and you can even convince yourself that you're relying upon his power. And you can still be deceived. But guided by the Holy Spirit. If you're allowing the Holy Spirit to give direction to your life. Then your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the way he exercises his Part in this is that he builds up your faith in Christ's sacrifice and he builds up your faith in relying upon him to sustain you. John 14, 16, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever as long as you live. But remember, the redeemed were just given immortality. So when you're talking about the redeemed, forever means exactly what we think it means. It's only when you're talking about the lost that forever isn't exactly what we like to think it means. Because they will live in those flames for a brief time, and then for them, forever is over. John 14, 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Teach and trigger our memory. I've had people say, I just, you know, I can't give Bible studies because somebody will ask me a question, I won't know the answer. Yeah, I've studied, I've read, but I just can't remember all that stuff. That's not your job. The Holy Spirit will bring it to your remembrance. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a Bible study and the, the person I'm studying with needs to hear a verse, a verse that I haven't thought of in 20 years. And then bang, there it is in my mind. The Holy Spirit did his job. He always does his job. He never fails to do his job. 
Our job is to trust him. He will teach. He will trigger the memory. Verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The clearest evidence, I don't say this to be judgmental, I'm just, I just have to speak the truth. I'm, I don't mean to offend, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I have to speak the truth. The clearest evidence that a church is not of God is that all they talk about is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not talk about himself. The Bible tells us clearly he only testifies of Jesus. Nevertheless, verse 7, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. And if I depart, I will send him to you. Cooperation with the Holy Spirit is how our name is entered in the Lamb's Book of Life. We just looked at that a few minutes ago. That's how it happens, cooperating with him. He prefers to use the Bible. After all, he inspired it to be written. But people who don't have a Bible can still have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works upon every life. And when you look at world history, the vast majority of the population of Earth have never had a Bible. Before we came to this country, the American Indians, the Native Americans, I'll be a little bit politically correct, I guess. Native Americans didn't have a Bible, but they still had the Holy Spirit. He was still trying to teach them right from wrong. And if they cooperated with the Holy Spirit, their name was entered in the Lamb's Book of Life. And God has a thousand years to finish their growth if they're willing to grow. And that's what cooperation with the Holy Spirit means, growing. Revelation 20 has given us a look at the millennium. Who will be there and why they will be there. God seeks to put a desire in our hearts to join him. I pray that he is successful with each of us. This is, this is the choice he died to give us. Without his death, we had no choice. We belonged to the devil, and his desire was to destroy the human race. Jesus stepped in to stop that. He died so that we could choose. And he's calling each of us to accept his offer of life. He simply wants to destroy sin and death without destroying us. That's it. He wants to destroy sin and death without destroying us. And he's made a plan to make that possible. In Matthew 25, 41, we're told clearly, the fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. It doesn't say it was prepared for the wicked, wicked human beings. The Bible doesn't say that. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. And if we're in it, it's because we refused God's plan for our life. Father, I pray, I pray, I hope everyone here is praying that we will take advantage of this choice that Jesus died to give us and simply cooperate with his Holy Spirit as he seeks to guide us into an ever-growing awareness of truth an ever-growing awareness of what it means to be loving, what it means to be kind, what it means to be thoughtful, what it means to regard others as equal and no one below. Pride telling us that we're better than somebody has to disappear, Lord. You regard us as equal and we're nowhere near equal to you. You're going to let us sit on thrones and reign with you as though we're equal and we're not. And we need to have that kind of love in us, in our thinking, in our hearts, in our interaction with our fellow human beings. 
we all come from the same Garden of Eden, the same original mother and original father. We are indeed all brothers and sisters in your family. It matters not the color of our skin. It matters not the level of our education. It matters not what is in our bank account. Lord, we are one family. Let us know that. Let us act that way. Let us allow your Holy Spirit to bring to reality what our minds are telling us right now is the truth. Bring it to reality in our behavior, in our words, thoughts, and actions. Let us be ambassadors of your kingdom of love. Let us be fit representatives, showing the world what it means to be a Christian. In Jesus' name.